Well, very good morning to you. The Prime Minister is urging a heavy dose of caution as the UK takes a major step out of lockdown. Hugs, foreign holidays and socialising indoors are back for many as restrictions ease across England, Wales and most of Scotland. But it comes amid growing concern about the Indian variant and fears it could spread rapidly amongst those not yet vaccinated. Helen Ann Smith reports on a big day on the road out of lockdown. The doors are open, so come on in. At midnight, rules relaxed. This, a comedy gig that just couldn't wait till the morning. Right now, in my own head, I'm in my own room and I can finish this gig just by going... Thump. Distancing in the rule of six may still apply indoors, but being back's a relief and a joy. I'm so giddy the idea of seeing people in the club, welcoming them in. You know, like there's something that happens, there's a magic that happens when an audience come together and every, everybody melts away and suddenly you're one laugh, you're one <laughs> um, kind of consciousness in a way. Without sounding too kind of hippie about it, it's just nice to be part of a group. Hugging and holidays are also now back, a coming together so many have craved. Hello, welcome back. At Ghetto Golf in Birmingham, they can't wait for more mixing. Like many, they've relied on a small outdoor bar. But the key attractions are inside. Having customers here means having staff back to work. We've just tried to uh, keep our teams motivated. We're just now excited that it's finally hospitality inside is opening. We can get all of the team back to work in a safe way. Uh, and we're just, we're all looking, really looking forward to it. But this is the backdrop and behind calls for caution. Surge testing in towns where the Indian variant is spreading. The Prime Minister has asked for responsible enjoyment. How people respond could matter immensely. When it's open up, I'm letting loose. I don't want to hear about the Indian variant, to be honest, because uh, I want it to open up and stay open. I want normality, so I'm going to try to be as normal as possible, but as safe as possible at the same time. And many have much rebuilding to do. Empty airports speak volumes about an industry embattled. Cleaning regimes may be second to none, but with most destinations off limits, there's only so much they can do. Pre-pandemic, Heathrow, we would serve around 240,000 passengers a day. And during the pandemic, that has absolutely fallen. And in the trough, it was less than 10,000 passengers a day. And we can't wait to welcome passengers back. More turbulence is possible, but it's still a step forward. Our old lives just may be in reach. Helen Ann Smith, Sky News. Well, let's have a look in detail at how the restrictions are changing across the UK and Wales is moving to alert level three. So from today, indoor hospitality reopens, meaning six people from up to six households can book a table. Bowling alleys, cinemas and indoor play areas can all reopen, as can holiday accommodation and museums and galleries. International travel can resume, but the Welsh Government is advising people to only travel abroad if it is essential. Nothing changes in Northern Ireland. Restrictions there won't be eased until next week. Most of Scotland moves to the lowest alert levels. The exceptions are Glasgow and Moray. They'll remain in level three due to the number of COVID-19 cases in those areas. For the areas in level one and level two, indoor socialising for up to six people from three households is allowed, as are overnight stays. Cinemas and theatres can reopen in those areas as well, and pubs and restaurants will be able to serve food and alcohol indoors until half ten. Similar relaxations to the rules in England. From today, you can finally hug your loved ones and stay overnight. Uh, but the government is asking people to be cautious about who you choose to have physical contact with. Indoor hospitality can reopen and up to six people from two households can meet indoors. Group exercise classes can resume. Saunas and steam rooms can reopen if you want to partake in, uh, into any of that. I mean, it, it is a, a strange situation, is it, when you look at uh, how the different rules apply to the three different countries. I mean, the, the number of households who can mix. It is all a sort of strange situation, isn't it? So you've got to pay really close attention if you want to then change your sort of habits from today. Well, let's get more details on all of this. We're joined in the studio by the business 
and uh, the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng. Good Hi, to see you this you? morning. Sorry to you, sneak him behind you there. <laughs> um, look, right. as we look at all of this, the Prime Minister is talking about an abundance of caution sure. in effect, which begs the question, if we have to be that cautious, why are we changing the rules in the first place? So it's always going to be a balance, um, and that was the whole point of the roadmap uh, when the Prime Minister announced it on the 22nd of February. There were these five-week uh, staging posts and the reason that it took five weeks was that we had to look at the evidence. Uh, today, I'm very pleased uh, that we're reopening. But clearly, uh, in order to reopen on the 21st, we're going to have to see the data. Now, there's nothing that we've seen so far that suggests that we're going to have to postpone that. But of course, there has to be some flexibility because we don't know what the coronavirus will do. I mean, it is this strange situation where, I mean, Sir Mark Walport told uh, Sophie Ridge yesterday, and he's a former uh, gov chief government scientific advisor, say, my advice is just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean you should. Well, in essence, when things are reopened, people aren't going to pay much heed to that, are they? Because people want to get out, they want to hug a loved one. Yeah, I mean, that's completely understandable, but it, it's, it's not that different what Sir Mark was saying to the Prime Minister's urge for caution. So, yes, uh, things are being opened up, but people should have common sense. Uh, they should uh, use uh, judgment. And I think if we act uh, in a reasonable way, there's no reason to just suppose that we can't reopen the economy entirely on the 21st of June. I think there's got to be a degree of, uh, of common sense, a bit of caution, um, and not people, you know, people shouldn't be running away uh, getting too exuberant, I suppose. I think we just need to be measured and cautious. Yeah, I mean, the problem is when you, when you rely on the great British public to exercise that common sense, well, that, that's all well and good, and a lot of people will, but we all know there will be people who won't. I mean, and, and this is potentially where that you get your problems and your hot spots, isn't it? Yes, I mean, the, the, there's always a balance, as I say, and you can't uh, com compulsorily... Uh, lock everything down forever. Uh, that's why we had a roadmap. We want to reopen in a safe, cautious way, and I think this is a, a good way to do that. I mean, will you be heading out to a restaurant? Have you made, have you made plans? <laughs> have you made plans to meet up and give some people a hug that you haven't seen I'm for a while? I'm going to be back in my constituency. Uh, I can't name the pub, but it'll be it'll be a lot of fun, I'm sure. Yeah. But we'll, yeah. it'll be moderate. I mean, I'm not going to be there with huge uh, hosts of people. No. <laughs> well, no, I'm sure not. You would have done a lot of trouble if you overdid it. Um, can we have a look at the travel situation? Because obviously, again, a lot of people very pleased about that um, and, and being able to sort of head abroad for the first time in, in, a, in a long time. But do you agree with Matt Hancock, who said just don't travel to one of the amber countries like Spain? Yeah, I think, I think Matt, obviously, being health secretary, is uh, firmly on top of the detail uh, and the numbers. Uh, and I think what he says makes sense. Again... Uh, people are allowed to do things, but it doesn't mean that everybody should be should be going away at the same time. I think the urge for caution makes sense. I think what Matt is saying is that, yes, you can go to a number country, but it would probably be advisable at this stage not to. I mean, you sort of wonder if it would have been more sensible, if, if, if that's the general approach, you know, the advice is don't go, then why not just sort of ban travel to any country that isn't on the green list? Well, of course, you could have be ultra-safe and just simply... Forget about the lock. Uh, forget about easing up and just continue with the lockdown. We've decided that that uh, wasn't the right course. Again, there's a balance between opening things up, uh, urging people to exercise caution, um, and do, opening things up safely. And that's that's a good balance, I think. But in terms of that caution, I mean, you'll be aware that I mean, there's there's a fair amount of concern over how we reacted to the India variant. I mean, there's. Mm. Uh, Civil Aviation Authority figures suggest 900 people arrived every day from India between April the 2nd and April the 23rd, when it wasn't even on the red list, so they weren't even being put in a... They weren't even being put in, in hotel accommodation. They, they, they had to quarantine and self-isolate, uh -huh. and, yeah. and then on the 23rd of April, uh, we, we put it um, on, on the red list before the variant had actually been identified. Um, are we confident that the, the vaccination programme is enough to deal with the Indian variant. Have you got any information on that? Um, again, uh, Matt Hancock said yesterday very clearly that he had a lot of confidence that mm. the vaccination uh, does work against the Indian variant. But, of course, we can't definitively prove anything until we, we've eased up and see what the, the actual data shows. 
And that's why we've got a degree of flexibility. But there's nothing in the evidence now that we've seen that suggests the vaccine uh, isn't very effective against the Indian uh, variant. I mean, obviously, we know that the, the state of vaccination in this country is very good. Um, but in, in hot spots like Bolton, where there is real concern over the Indian variant, particularly in a place like Bolton, um, they seem to be in a position now where they're vaccinating anybody who wants it. They're sort of encouraging anyone to come forward. Do you approve of that? Does the government approve of that? No, I think the government has very clear guidelines in terms of uh, the ordered way in which we uh, roll out the vaccine. And as you said, that's been working. It's been a very effective uh, rollout. And we would suggest that uh, people should do it in, in, the, in, the, in the correct order, in the right way. But would you... I mean, would the government try to put pressure on uh, an authority like Bolton to stop that, then? I, I don't know the actual details of what's going on in Bolton, but I don't think, uh, you know, we've got very firm guidelines and we want people to follow those. But it, it... I mean, what they're obviously actively trying to do is is stop the spread of the Indian variant amongst the, amongst the younger population and, as a result, try to avoid the possibility, at least, of a local lockdown for that area. I mean... If, I if, but, yeah. but, but if they if, if they can source the vaccines to do that, isn't that a wise approach? I can see what they're trying to do. Uh, I can see exactly what they're trying to do. But what I've said is that I think there's a really good way that we've managed to roll out the vaccine. You yourself acknowledged that it's been very successful and we would suggest urge people to follow the, the guidelines that we've set out and the method that we've used. Within all of this, um, obviously, I mean, and within, within your remit, I mean, the hospitality sector has yeah. been so badly hit. They're looking forward to, to getting up and running a, a lot more at the moment. I mean, there's a report claiming 10% of restaurants have closed down. The last thing anyone wants to sure. do is, is reopen to be shut down again. But there's no guarantee, is there? That, that come June, we may have to look at all this again. Yeah, I mean, we've been very clear. That's why there were the five-week uh, staging posts. There's got to be flexibility. But as business secretary, I know, and I hear it every day, the immense uh, pressure that hospitality and retail uh, has, has experienced. I mean, there's a huge amount of uh, anxiety, jobs. People want to open up the economy so that they can get trading again and get back to normality, and I completely understand that. That's why we have the roadmap. Uh, and that's why I fully expect that we'll be reopened on the 21st of June. You, are, you, you still think, despite the concern over Indian variant, that that, that could happen? I think, it, I think it's very likely to happen. I said that I think the vaccines are, are working against the Indian uh, variant. I think we've got to look at the numbers, so we've got some flexibility. But there's nothing that I've seen and there's nothing that the Prime Minister has seen up to now that suggests that we, we, we're going to delay that 21st of June date. I mean, the problem is, though, is that the, when you look at people heading out and about... I mean, it's not exclusively the younger end of the sure. population who haven't been vaccinated, but it's more likely to... I mean, I'm, mm. I'm in my 40s and I don't <laughs> feel like going out anymore. Um, <laughs> it, it's Speak like, for yourself. Well, I know, but, but it is likely to be the younger, yeah. unvaccinated people who are True. going to go out, isn't it? Yeah, look, there are risks in this. Um, and and we, we, we can't say now, uh, we can't guarantee that everything will be fine. What we can do, uh, is, and we've said this consistently, is that we'll look at the data and we'll make judgments according to the data that we see. So far, so good. We're reopening uh, on the 17th of May, as we said we should, in the way that we said we would. Uh, and now we have to see what happens ahead of the 21st of June. I'm confident that we'll be able to get to the 21st of June and open up uh, normally, but I can't guarantee that now. Mm. OK. Minister, good to talk to you Thank this morning. You. Thank you. Now, Israel has carried out a series of airstrikes on Gaza overnight following rocket attacks by Palestinian militants. It follows a warning from the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, that military operations against Palestinian Hamas militants will continue with full force. Our foreign affairs editor, Deborah Haynes, reports from Jerusalem. Israeli airstrikes smashed down on Gaza for a seventh straight night. Israel's military said it targeted the homes of nine Hamas commanders and a network of underground tunnels. No word yet on whether civilians were also caught up in the barrage. <laughs> Yesterday, the deadliest so far for Palestinians in this conflict. This little girl had been trapped for at least 10 hours in the rubble. Reunited with her father, a miracle amidst so much misery. But four of their family members, including three young children, among those who perished, 
Israel says it's only going after Palestinian militants, but it's civilians paying the price. On the other side of the border, more Hamas rockets fired towards Israel. Better protection here, though, as air defence missiles blast many out of the sky over the seaside city of Ashkelon. It's very frightening. So is your house damaged? Uh, my house, just a, a glass, a little, become the boom, not, not a boom inside, just two years. Suddenly, a warning of incoming fire. She races for cover. Danger over. Everyone steps back outside. Rockets not the only threat. A man rams into a police checkpoint at a neighborhood in East Jerusalem, shot dead. Fury at a Jewish legal attempt to evict Palestinians from Sheikh Jarrah was one of the sparks to ignite this crisis. Hamas's leader even name-checking the area in a speech warning Israel's prime minister not to play with fire. Benjamin Netanyahu not backing down. Our campaign against the terrorist organizations is continuing with full force. We make Hamas pay a very high price for their intolerable aggression. Mounting devastation in Gaza and rocket fire on Israel, underlining the need for urgent diplomacy to broker a ceasefire. Until then, the pain grows. Deborah Haynes, Sky News, Ashkelon. Let's talk to our correspondent, Alex Rossi, who's in Jerusalem for us this morning. And Deborah talks about the need for diplomacy, Alex, but I mean, it just doesn't show any signs of appearing at this stage, does it? Well, certainly there is a great deal of diplomacy going on behind the scenes, but what is visible, what we can see at the moment is certainly not delivering uh, a ceasefire. Now, the Security Council met yesterday uh, afternoon, all 15 members calling for an immediate de-escalation of the violence. But as is so often uh, the case in the Israel-Palestine conflict, it reached no conclusion and no firm action. Now, that diplomacy is continuing uh, today. Also, the uh, envoys from Egypt and Qatar are working behind the scenes as well, talking to Hamas. The Israeli side is being talked to as well by mediators from the United States. Uh, but as I was saying, no conclusion yet. In fact, if anything, the violence seems to have been worsening overnight. Now, local reports in Gaza suggest that the uh, bombardment, which started in the early hours of this morning by the Israeli Air Force, was some of, if not the heaviest uh, bombardment that they have experienced in this conflict, with some saying it's even heavier uh, than aerial strikes that they experienced during the 2014 uh, conflict. Now, the Israeli Defense Force say they were targeting uh, homes of Hamas operatives, which they claim were being used as weapon storages. But, of course, Gaza City is an extremely packed, populous place, and there will undoubtedly be, as there have been in the past, civilian casualties. Now, rescue teams are on the ground surveying the devastation. We're waiting for those reports uh, at the moment. On the other side, of course, Hamas is continuing to fire uh, rockets um, into uh, Israel, uh, and those are likely to continue as well. So no sign at the moment that this violence is going to uh, stop. And of course, as it continues, as it escalates, it is civilians that are going to be paying the highest price. OK, Alex, thank you. Now also making the headlines for you this morning. And an assistant rabbi has been hospitalised after being attacked outside his synagogue in Essex. Police say the attack in Chigwell could have been religiously motivated. Police in London have made four arrests after a group of people waving Palestinian flags drove through parts of London shouting violent anti-Semitic threats. 
It's believed to have happened in North London's Finchley Road, where there's a large Jewish community. Officials in Australia have denied easing quarantine measures for a group of cricket stars travelling from India. 38 players and staff travelled via the Maldives following the suspension of the Indian Premier League. Cricket Australia says the group will now have to serve 14 days in quarantine. The value of Bitcoin has fallen by more than 6.5% overnight after a tweet by the boss of the car company Tesla. Elon Musk, whose company invested in the cyber currency, suggested on social media they would consider selling some of their holding. New research suggests regular gamblers are six times more likely to bet online than before the pandemic. The study found a decrease in gambling overall, but online betting grew significantly over lockdown. Now, the government says it will not support the NHS giving COVID vaccines to people of all ages at present. It follows reports that officials in Bolton have been giving the jab to anyone following an increase in the India variant of coronavirus in the region. Well, a short time ago, the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, told me that the vaccine should be given in order of age. I think the government has very clear guidelines in terms of uh, the ordered way in which we uh, roll out the vaccine. And as you said, that's been working. It's been a very effective uh, rollout. And we would suggest that uh, people should do it in, in, the, in, the, in the correct order, in the right way. I mean, what they're obviously actively trying to do is, is stop the spread of the Indian variant amongst the, amongst the younger population and, as a result, try to avoid the possibility, at least, of a local lockdown for that area. I mean, I if, if, but, yeah. but, but if, they, if, if they can source the vaccines to do that... Isn't that a wise approach? I can see what they're trying to do. Uh, I can see exactly what they're trying to do. But what I've said is that I think there's a really good way that we've managed to roll out the vaccine. You yourself acknowledged that it's been very successful and we would suggest, urge people to follow the, the guidelines that we've set out. Well, let's talk to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Good to see you this morning. Can we talk about this to begin with? Because I know there are, there are 400 cases, I think, of Indian variant reported in the capital so far. Would you support the idea of just vaccinating all age groups now? Well, in general terms, I understand the advice from the government and the experts to go by age. But actually, in those parts of the country where there are pockets of people who have this Indian variant, I think we should be nimble and we should be giving the vaccine to younger people in those areas. Why? Because the early evidence is, if you receive the vaccine, less likely to catch this variant. The spread is uh, less serious, but also the consequences, should you catch it, are less serious as well. So I think we should be nimble. And I've asked uh, both Matt Hancock and Nazim Zahawi, the various ministers, on Friday, to give us the flexibility to give younger people the vaccine in those parts of London where we're concerned about this strain. I was going to say, for, I mean, for somewhere the size of the capital, I mean, you, you couldn't do it a, across the whole population, could no. you? and that's why I understand uh, what the government are saying and the health advice across the country is. What we're saying, though, is uh, be nimble in relation to... In those pockets where we know there's an issue, let's uh, use the vaccine sensibly. So in London, the good news is we're now testing everybody who's tested positive, the, 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 the gene sequence, see whether they've got this particular Indian variant. So we know which parts of our city there's a concern. And so what we should be doing in those particular boroughs is having a hyper-local approach and encouraging those who are younger, who'd have to wait a few weeks to have the vaccine now to avoid this uh, strain spreading. I mean, do you have the authority to do that? I mean, could you, could, as we're seeing in Bolton, they just seem to have said, we're just going to do it. Do you have that authority? Well, it's, it's the NHS who administer the vaccine. They're working incredibly hard. It's been a great success with uh, local uh, communities. Uh, the NHS have got to follow the advice from up above. That's why I, I approached Matt Hancock and Nadeem Zahawi on Friday, asking for this flexibility, which I think is really important. The, the virus isn't rigid and doesn't follow rigid rules, uh, and we've got to be nimble in relation to our response to it. I mean, the, the, the problem you're going to face in the capital, presumably, is where you have these various pockets. I mean, one of the things that is going to change today is you are, we are going to see more people back on public transport, back on the buses, back on the tubes. It's going to spread, isn't it? Well, a number of things. Firstly, the good news now versus uh, the peak in last uh, winter was we have reduced the amount of people with the virus by 98%. We've reduced those in hospital by uh, 96% because people have made sacrifices. But also, we finally have an effective test and trace system. So anybody who tests positive, we can 
trace who they've been in contact with. And that's why I'm encouraging all Londoners and those across the country, test regularly. You can get free lateral flow tests, test twice a week as a habit, and separately take a, a PCR test regularly. The good news in London is if somebody does a PCR test and they unfortunately test positive, we check what strain they've got, and also we track and trace as well. I mean, obviously, today, with things opening up, I know you're sort of heading a campaign to try and get more people out and about and eating in London, which a lot of, you know, I know a lot of people are going to want to do it. I don't think you're going to have a huge amount of problem getting persuading people. But, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult sort of circle to square, isn't it, in that you've got, you know, you've, you've got to protect the capital's businesses whilst protecting the population. Yeah, look, the health of individuals is linked with the health of our economy. But here's the good news. Uh, uh, you know, cool bars, uh, uh, you know, uh, restaurants, uh, cultural uh, attractions, uh, uh, hospitality venues, they've worked so hard to make sure their places are COVID uh, safe. Of course, we've got to still follow the rules. Social distance, wash your hands regularly and thoroughly, uh, wear a face mask when you use public transport. Uh, but I think Londoners and those across the country are raring to go in a safe uh, way. So we've begun the biggest uh, domestic tourism campaign London's ever seen, encouraging Londoners to come back to the West End and encouraging those across the country who may be a bit crestfallen and they can't go on the international holidays. Don't worry, everything you need is in London. I was going to say, because that's, that's ultimately the problem, isn't it, with a lack of international and, and national tourists and the hybrid working, which means people aren't just popping out to buy a sandwich in their lunch hour or what have you. I mean, that footfall is going to be well down. Well, here's the good news. This is probably the only spring and summer when you aren't competing against international tourists. So you can go to the world's best museums and galleries and not need to queue. You can get a booking at one of our uh, best restaurants without needing to get a, a booking. And it's really important that we, of course, have a good time, stay safe, but also protect jobs. And the reality is one out of five Londoners works in hospitality or culture. And so you can safely uh, have a great time but also support British business. Mm. Look, and, it, and it's nice to have a positive outlook. I think we all want a little bit of that at the moment. Um, on a less positive front, can I just ask you about the anti-Semitism? Obviously, the, the situation that's going on in Israel and, and Gaza it, is hugely concerning, and people can have their views on that. But what we have seen is, is some incidents in London, of, and if you've seen the clips on YouTube and, and what have you, I mean, some absolute vile language, which is which is anti-Semitic, oh, and, and, and absolutely vile. Now, now, what can what are you doing to to protect to try and calm the temperature on that and and protect the Jewish community in London? Well, I've been I've been in contact this weekend with uh, both the commissioner and deputy commissioner, and the police are working incredibly hard. And it's important to make, for me to make this point. And it's possible at the same time to be very angry about what's happening in Israel and Gaza and the West Bank and be heartbroken at the death and to call for a ceasefire and a de-escalation. What's not excusable is, on the other hand, to use it as an excuse to be anti-Semitic and to be racist. Uh, there can be no excuse for that. Uh, so uh, Jewish Londoners in particular will see in the communities where they live, uh, but also synagogues and uh, Jewish schools, an increased police presence, just to make you feel safe, but also to make sure anybody who's involved in any race crimes, and they are crimes, by the way, uh, action is taken. And it's important for us to realise that actually uh, the impact of uh, this criminal behaviour has a ripple of fear effect on Jewish Londoners and those across the country. And it's really important that we don't bring conflicts 3,000 miles away to the capital city. OK. Steve Khan, good to talk to you. Thank you. Now, next year, celebrations will take place across the UK as the Queen celebrates her Platinum Jubilee. There'll be an extra bank holiday to mark 70 years on the throne. But now the royal family are asking anyone to plant a tree as part of the commemoration. Our Royal Correspondent, Brianna Mills, reports. The princess planted a young oak tree, specially flown to Canada from Windsor Park. For decades, all around the world, it's been part of the royal day job. The Queen planting more than 1,500 trees during her reign. So it couldn't feel more fitting that we're all being asked to plant a tree for her platinum jubilee. You wouldn't left me much to do. <laughs> in Windsor, in March, the Prince of Wales, watched by his mother, planted the first as patron of the project. Whether you are an individual hoping to plant a single sapling in your garden, a school or community group planting a tree, a council, charity or business intending to plant a whole avenue of trees, or a farmer looking to create new hedgerows, everyone across the country can get involved. 
One of the founding partners, Royal Mail, have planted trees in every nation to kickstart the project. But the rest of us are being asked to wait until the next planting season, starting in October, giving schools, villages, businesses and individuals the summer to plan. The Woodland Trust giving away three million saplings to support it. Trees are incredibly important features of, of many landscapes and in this country we could do with a lot more of them, which is the whole point of the Queen's Green Canopy. But on top of expanding tree and woodland cover across the country, this is also a celebration of ancient trees and ancient woodlands. The Queen's Green Canopy will dedicate a network of 70 ancient woodlands across the United Kingdom and identify 70 important ancient trees to mark the Jubilee. But significantly, it's also another way of the royal family again championing the climate change agenda. We recognise that as a nation we have huge numbers of challenges ahead of us in terms of the climate crisis and to be honest the best technology we have for sucking carbon out of the air is the tree. So if the 22 million people who have a garden in their household were just to put one tree in and everyone else were just to encourage uh, to find somewhere else in the country to put a tree in the ground then we'd be in a far better place to address that crisis as well. Next year will be an unprecedented national moment, celebrating her 70 years as Queen, a milestone never achieved by any other British monarch, marked by a project that doesn't just look back, but is hoped will leave a lasting environmental impact for our future. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News. Now, along with all the changes that are happening today, which of course crucially involves hospitality, universities are also welcoming back some students for face-to-face -face teaching. Now, many have been away from lecture theatres and their friends for more than a year. Well, third-year sociology and criminology student Jess Herbert joins us now. Good to see you this morning. I mean, I've got to ask first and foremost, is there any point in you going back at this stage? Um, for me personally, no, because um, my lectures actually finished on the 14th of May. So when the government did announce the 17th, I knew that it would be disappointing because it wouldn't affect me in any way because I would have just completely finished my degree by that point. What impact has all this had? I mean, when were you last there? Was it sort of Christmas time? Um, the last time I was there was before the November lockdown. So the last time I was actually there was October. So I haven't actually been back to my campus since then. I just wonder what impact this has had on your education, do you think? Um, it has been difficult and I think everyone learns differently. Um, me personally, I find being at home and online teaching really difficult to engage with. So I definitely have missed the in-person teaching. Um, and I do think to some degrees it has impacted my work, if anything, and mental health concentration. It's just everything has been affected by it. And of course, university life itself is different. And we, for those of us old enough to look back at it with sort of rose tinted glasses, it's, it's more about, it's more than just about education, of course. Yeah, it's really difficult um, not seeing friends for so long and even to finish the degree and not be able to be with those people is really disappointing. Um, I know it kind of is what it is and there's only so much we can do, but it kind of feels like it's come to an end really abruptly and quite disappointingly. I mean, what would you like to have seen? I think the, the main thing would be more communication with what was actually happening with uni students. It kind of felt like we were left in the dark or were kind of a passing thought especially with restrictions easing, a lot of the time we weren't even mentioned. And it's just been a really disappointing time to not have any communication or know what's going on. And even to maybe acknowledge that um, from the 17th, a lot of us won't actually be going back. Yeah, I mean, it's all sort of ended with a, a bit of a, whim a whimper, hasn't it? Which isn't what you want. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a bit of an anticlimax moment, but it just would have been nice for some communication to know what was going on sooner and even just to be acknowledged about what uni students are actually going through at the moment. In all of this, I mean, all universities themselves are in difficult positions financially with a lot of this, but I mean, if, if you had value for money for your degree, do you think? Um, I think that the uni have done what they can, um, which I appreciate under the circumstances, but it is quite 
I feel like you can't really deny the fact that you are paying the full tuition fee for things like in-person teaching or access to resources at the uni, the library. And we haven't got that. So I don't understand why we're still being charged the full amount when online open uni is significantly less money. And that's essentially what we've been doing for a year and a half. And what about the rent situation? Um, so I'm very lucky. I'm at, I only commute to uni, so I haven't had the stress of that. But um, I know a lot of people who have, especially when they were advised not to go back to their flats, the stress of paying all this money for a flat somewhere and then not even having access to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's been a really tough time for students. Jess, it's good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, here in the UK, the COVID vaccine programme has been rolled out according to age, as you will be aware. But now the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, is calling for all vaccines to be evenly distributed globally so the world's poorest are protected sooner. Well, Tony Blair joins us now. It's really good to see you once again this morning. Look, this sounds like, on, on the surface, a very honourable system, but how do you convince countries that now is the time to stop focusing on their own nations and to look outwards? Well, they should do both. I mean, there's no way any country is going to give up its vaccines if it has vaccines to vaccinate its entire population, which we do. Obviously, we've got to vaccinate our own people. Really, what we're saying in this paper is at the same time, we should be making sure that we're keeping vaccination production going so that we can vaccinate those parts of the world that at present don't have access to vaccines, they urgently need them. And it's in our own interest that they do get vaccinated because the biggest problem we now have is that even if we do everything, which we are doing now to vaccinate our own people, if you get variants, new um, types of, of COVID disease that arise in different parts of the world, the risk is that they then come back into our own country. And you can see this obviously with the Indian variant now. So the important thing is at the same time as we're vaccinating our own people, what we do is we've set out a, a plan, a detailed plan for the international community to make sure we're maximizing production and distribution to all parts of the world, at least so that in those parts of the world that are the poorest and where they don't have enough vaccine at present, we vaccinate at least the most vulnerable, the key workers, and the big urban populations, because that will stop the spread of the virus to other parts of the world. I mean, it, isn't this, why is this down to governments then rather than just the, the big pharmaceuticals? And we know AstraZeneca, for example, have been providing a lot of stuff at, at cost price. I mean, why do the governments need to get involved? Because the, the, the governments are the only ones that can coordinate how you increase the vaccination production. So, for example, it's important to make sure that some of the, the production of vaccine at the moment, there's been vaccine being produced for other types of condition, that we're repurposing some of that. And that really requires government to, to help negotiate that with the big pharma companies so that you can increase the amount of COVID vaccine and get it distributed. You also need government because, for example, at the moment in Africa, you've got about 1.2 billion people You've got roughly, I'm afraid, at the moment, just over 30 million doses of vaccine delivered for the entire continent. We need to make sure that we're getting more vaccine to the African continent by maximizing the supply of vaccine. But the additional problem you have is that of that over 30 million, only a small part of it has yet been actually used for the population. So you also need to work with governments so that they're able to absorb the vaccine they're being given and vaccinate their population effectively. I mean, I was going to say, logistics is a, a huge issue here. Are we going to be relying on NGOs, I mean, the, the, the charity groups, that sector, to, to actually deliver a lot of this? Well, some of it, but, but you can also help governments. Is one of the things my institute does is actually work with governments to plan a vaccine rollout you know, to, to have the vaccination centres in the right place so that you're actually getting the jabs to the people who, who need them. There's one other thing which is important, and it's also important here, we've got to combat the vaccine hesitancy. I mean, part of the problem we have is that the people who are entitled to vaccines and who could get vaccines here as well as abroad are not getting them. And, you know, it, it, one of the things I've, I've said constantly over the last couple of months is that because Britain is one of the very few countries, probably uniquely placed actually, because we're giving 
vaccine, Pfizer vaccine, which is the messenger RNA vaccine, and then AstraZeneca, which is the uh, adenovirus vaccine. You're giving these two different types of vaccine that are the two different types really being used in the world. We have more data than any other country in the world, which would allow us to say, here are the numbers that are being vaccinated. Of those after vaccination, how, how many have got COVID? How many of those have been hospitalized? How many of those have died? I think if we were to publish those figures, we would find that people would see it's absolutely clear, one, that you should get vaccinated, and secondly, that AstraZeneca specifically is a good and effective vaccine. <clears throat> yes, but the, the, the problem is when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, some is around safety issues and effectiveness issues, but a lot of it is cultural, isn't it? Well, some of it's, it's culture, but it's, it's more to do with rumour. I mean, you, you actually have a crazy situation at the moment where you've got African countries turning away AstraZeneca vaccine on the basis that it may have health problems, when the health problems from getting COVID are self-evidently infinitely greater than the problems that you may get in very, very limited numbers of cases with, for example, blood clots. So, you know, in the end, yeah, the, the, in some parts of the world, there are, there are some cultural issues, but by far the biggest problem is people hearing rumours, stuff flying around the internet, and people thinking, you know, I'm not sure I, I should really get vaccinated. So, for example, a lot of young people will think, look, do I really need to get vaccinated? You know, if I get the disease, I'm not likely to get hospitalised or die. Is it really important for me to do it? And the answer is, absolutely it is because you could still get, even if you're asymptomatic, you could get conditions further down the line as a result of having had COVID. And then of course you have the whole issue to do with long COVID, which is a, a huge problem. So it's really important that we're saying to young people particularly, do not think that this is just a disease for people over 50, over 60. No, it can affect you too. Um, can I ask you about the situation in Israel? I mean, obviously you, you're a Middle East envoy for, for a time. I mean, how, concerned are you by what we're seeing at the moment and 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 indeed by the role the UK is playing now because we from what we're aware we don't seem to be really getting involved in this not in a in a sort of obvious way look it's a hard it's a it's a heartbreaking situation um Stephen I mean it, 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 I, I am still involved in it um I have an office um, out in the Middle East, and we still work um, on this issue. You know, it's unless you deal with the underlying problems, then I'm afraid every so often you are going to get these conflicts that are horrific in their consequence for ordinary people. And, you know, you, the international community can say whatever it wants to say about de escalation and stopping the conflict. The truth is, it will continue for a time at least. Um, but afterwards, the single most important thing is that we get a viable, clear process for resolving the underlying problems of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And at that, po at that point, we've got a chance then of avoiding future conflicts. But whilst the situation remains as it is, this, I'm afraid, periodically is what you get. And it is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, but it will now continue for some time, I think, until as it were, you know, the conditions are right for a, a ceasefire, but that is only a ceasefire. And what we need is to tackle those underlying problems. I mean, I mean, it, it's difficult, I know. I mean, there's a lot of international concern, I guess, about engaging Hamas in, in negotiation. Um, is that something we should be looking at more actively? Well, I, I have had... Um, interactions with Hamas myself. Um, look, Hamas as an organization at the moment are constituted in a way that does represent a direct threat to, to Israel. Um, if rockets are coming out of Gaza, the Israelis will retaliate. That is just a, the fact of the matter because their civilian population is under attack. Um, the retaliation is then hard and that means also there is loss of life in Gaza. So it's the problem is that you need a completely different approach to this conflict. Now, the thing that I've worked on the last few years and continue to work on is that my belief is you're only going to get a solution when it is a region-wide Arab-Israeli solution and not simply an Israeli-Palestinian solution. So, you know, we can I could go into all the detail of that, but there won't be time. But 
the, the truth of the matter is if we don't deal with these fundamental problems, including the nature of the threat Israel faces, including the situation of the Palestinian people as it presently is, the divisions, by the way, in Palestinian politics, which are also a huge problem, unless you deal with these underlying problems, then you know the international community can wring its hands and people can look at these pictures and be absolutely appalled and want action to be taken. But the truth is there will be no solution to this unless we get down to the fundamentals. OK, look, just before we let you go, can I ask you about Keir Starmer? I know you've commented about the state of the Labour Party uh, over the weekend, but um, do you think Sir Keir has either the policies or the charisma to, to win at a general election? Well, he's got the character and the capability, which are two really important qualities. But, you know, look, I, I, don't, I don't want to add to all the things I've said in the, in the past couple of weeks. You know, my view of the Labour Party is that if it wants to be a viable opposition, never mind a viable government, it's got to make fundamental change. But, you know, I think it's best to, now that we've all had our say, to let Keir have some space to try and sort things out. I think he's certainly got the will and the attention to do that. So let's, let's give him that chance. OK, Tony Blair, always good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you.